Good afternoon. Welcome to Intentions and Interfaces, Making Patterns Concrete. My name is Uri Dahan. I'm seeing some uh, familiar faces from my previous talks, so I'll keep the spiel about myself uh, as brief as possible. My name is Uri Dahan. I'm known as the software simplest. I deal with enterprise scale projects, um, an MVP from Microsoft, a master architect from ISA. It's the International Association of Software Architects. And what we're going to be talking today is about a set of common problems that lots of big teams, and not even large, humongous teams, but even any team of five to seven developers can run into. And the larger the system, the bigger and more painful these problems are. And talk about a set of patterns that solves them and how to apply them with examples in three areas, uh, three most common areas that developers deal with when building these large-scale systems. So the patterns movement in general has been going on for a while. I'm guessing most everybody's read the, the famous Gang of Four book. But since then, we've had more and more books and throwing more and more patterns at us. Well, one of the pattern books that I talked about just the previous session was Patterns of Enterprise Application Architecture. And on top of that book, there's also this book, Pattern-Oriented Software Architecture. Anybody familiar with that? Poza? Yes? Now, this book had an additional couple hundred patterns in it. Uh, luckily for us, we have five books on Poza, actually. And all together, with all the previous patterns, we're closing to 1,500 patterns. And we got the good friends, uh, Eric Evans coming in and heaping on a whole bunch of additional patterns on his end, and more and more and more books. Got the EIP book, Enterprise Integration Patterns book. In other words, we're inundated with patterns. As software developers, we know that we shouldn't be reinventing the wheel every time we've got a new problem to solve. The problem is there are just so many wheels to choose from when going to build an app. And we can get into these heated debates about you know, why this wheel is better than that wheel. And it was really difficult to know how to pick the right one. Now, one of the overarching themes of all of these patterns and all these books is to bring us flexibility to make a supple, pliant system that we can change, we can evolve over time, be able to performance tune it, we're going to be able to refactor it. All the wonderful things that we want from patterns, the main idea is for us to get some flexibility out of it. And that's what we're going to be talking about is not so much the how of all the patterns that we've seen, but how we take a fairly Simple, straightforward style of programming even. It's not even a pattern. And see how that solves a lot of the problems that many of these patterns come to solve as well. So what we're going to be looking at in terms of a solution is these intentional interfaces. Now those of you that were in my previous talk saw one example of that, and we're going to be going through that again for people who weren't in my previous talk. And we're going to be seeing how this style of programming, this being explicit about our intentions, plays out in multiple domains. And one of them, common problem, is validation. How do we deal with validation in using this intentional interface? Data access is the one that we saw in the previous session. We're going to be going through that again fairly quickly. And service layers. We're talking about problems in the various areas and the solutions that we get to using this style of programming. Now, you know, way back earlier on in my career, when we were building systems, you know, we had that goal of flexibility in mind. We always had this, this principle that we've got to keep the system flexible. We can't have it being rigid. But rigidity is not something that is an inherent property of the design. When you go to design a system, nobody goes and designs a rigid system not on purpose, but it kind of grows that way over time. If you're not careful, 
things start hardening up. It becomes more difficult to change as you go along. And even for those of us that keep trying to refactor, it becomes harder and harder over time to refactor the system to what we want it to do. And what we want to find is some way, some style of pattern in order to prevent this from happening. So when I started out, the main patterns that, that I saw coming to play were these two characters, visitor pattern and the strategy pattern. Both of them working in slightly different way. I see them you know, in lots of solutions these days as being, you know, here's one way of introducing code from the outside, and here's another way. And the first time, it, it, they sounded like great ideas. Like, like a lot of things, um, there's a big difference between the theory and the practice. So it sounds like a good idea at first when we started with the visitor pattern in that project was that, it's kind of difficult to see, but you have to have a method for each concrete element that you put in on that visitor interface. That's the pattern. So anytime we went to apply this visitor pattern to our system in order to go about keeping rigidity from creeping in, we had to always go back to that interface, that core interface that everything depended on, and start introducing another method. Visit customer, now visit product, now visit preferred customer, now visit on sale product. And this visitor interface started growing. And for, after a while, we realized it, it wasn't the right path. Said, OK, stop. We understand. We pick the wrong pattern. It can happen to the best of us. Let's go do strategy. Strategy was supposed to be a lot better. That's what everybody told us to do. Do strategy. Here's the strategy pattern in all its glory. Now, the great thing about it, we have multiple strategies that we put down there. Anytime we want to add a new one, we put it in there. But we have this issue of containment. What that means is that for everything that we think we might need, we need to set up this interface and have our concrete other parts of the system, the context, depend upon that. So anytime we wanted to introduce something into the system, like security, like fetching strategies, we had to go through all of our contexts and start ripping them up and introducing the strategies in. That's a problem for small systems, but can it, it can really bring down a large system. If any time you need to make a change to the system in something like a cross-cutting concern, if you have to change a lot of code, that can destabilize the system can break backwards compatibility. A lot of bad things happen when we start messing around with too much code. That's often an indication that we're going down the wrong path. But we were in a little bit of a catch-22. I mean, we had all these patterns at our disposal, but it seemed like every single pattern that we called upon, you know, each one solved one problem but introduced another one. And often the problem that it introduced was much larger and more difficult for us to solve. We wanted to find a way that we could avoid this from happening. Because what we saw happening was that our beautiful, you know, high-level structure of keeping infrastructure code on one side and application code on the other side didn't really work out that well. Things started mixing and matching and breaking and hooking. We, there's no clean divide. And once we put it as a picture, it's kind of clear that the patterns weren't working out. We weren't quite sure why. It seemed like any pattern we introduced brought a lot of problems with it. And on the strategy pattern side, it seemed like we had to design a lot of it up front. We had to think about all of these concerns that we might put in to ready the context for it so that we wouldn't have to change it again later, to have all the strategy interfaces set up so that we could plug them in later, even if we had nothing to do in the meantime. And the Agile guys are saying, you know, you, know, you aren't going to need it. Stop it. It's painful. When it's painful, stop. But we, we, we kept looking for how do we go about introducing new concerns to a pre-existing system 
without having to break a whole bunch of existing code, without having to touch it. And that's really the problem that a lot of us are in today. We're kind of forced into the predicting business, extrapolating about the future. Now, prediction is very, very difficult, especially if it's about the future. It's very easy to predict the past. But that's the problem that we have. When, when we're doing this architecture and we're doing the design work, we're supposed to think about all the things that might happen and set up our system in such a way so that you know, one year from now, when we get the security requirements, when we get the auditing requirements, when finally we have to uh, comply with uh, HIPAA, have to integrate H11 HLevel 7, have to be SOX compliant, whatever it is, we have to have a plan in place so that when that happens, we'll be ready. But that's a challenge with all these things that, well, they're coming and you need to be ready, but how ready is ready? We can't necessarily know in advance what needs to flex in the system and how. Part of building a flexible system is that we don't need to be very predictive. And a lot of the patterns that we tried, they were very much focused on now. If you have a problem now, this is how you solve it. But very little about how do you prevent problems in the future from creeping in. So what we really wanted was some way to bolt on the flexibility when we needed it, where we needed it, without very much fuss. You need security now, okay, we'll bolt it on. If we didn't need to think about it, if we could structure the system in such a way that we could fit it in where necessary, that would be great. But we kept going round and round and round on this, never seemed to get anywhere. And like most companies do when we get ourselves into trouble, brought in a consultant, fairly old guy, been around the block you now maybe a hundred times or more, and he is the one that showed us the light. Talked a little bit funny, but you could kind of get what he was saying. Now, what he told us about flexibility was counterintuitive. That try to imitate his voice. Flexibility you seek? <laughs> Major roles explicit, have you? No. That is why you fail. And at the crux of it, that's really the whole message of this talk and the whole flexibility story in general. Make roles explicit. Three simple words. But the question is, what's a role? And how do I make it explicit? And even if I do that, will it really give me flexibility? So one way of representing a role in the system, when you think about what a role is, it's a given actor in a given context. Okay? So same actor in a different context, that's a different role. So the requirement for a role is that the same actor can fulfill multiple roles. So that's kind of like multiple inheritance, but we know multiple inheritance is bad from a concrete perspective. But if we represented roles not as classes, but as interfaces, we could have a single actor, a single class, inherit slash implement multiple roles, multiple interfaces. Now, technically, this is simple stuff. I mean, we all know interfaces, whether Java crowd, .NET crowd, serializable, iSerializable, you know, what have you. Personally, I, I really like the I interface, although my uh, Java friends, you know, they heckle me about it all the time. But I find that it's very representative of the real world. As a person, as, you know, Udi Dahan, who I am, I am an I father, an I husband. In the morning, I go to work, and then I come home, and like a good I husband, I wash the dishes. It's just like real life. Well, you know, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. But turning this around saying, well, what does all these interfaces mean? How do I take this, make all these fairly simple interfaces, pull them into something like validation? Good story, good spiel, make roles explicit. Yeah, I get it, three words. But 
when I have to go about validating, and you know, I have lots of things to validate, I have to validate it, zip codes and addresses and customers and orders. I got all sorts of stuff that I need to validate in the system before I go save it. I don't really have any garbage in my system. So what I'd like is to solve the common problem of validation. I'll show you what the common problem is. The object-oriented way of doing validation is to have the object validate itself. So before we go to save a customer, we want to dot validate our customer, and then we'll dot persist it. And but you know the customer, in order to dot validate itself, it needs to go over all of its orders and dot validate them. So okay. And it has to dot validate its address. So far, so good. But as we know, we don't always start at the customer. Sometimes we perform a change to an order. And then we'd like to dot validate our order. But in order for the order to validate itself, it needs to go and dot validate its customer. And when the customer is dot validating itself, it goes and dot validates its orders again. But then we get into these you know, infinite recursions, but which is okay because we introduce these flags. Boolean is validating so that we'll know that we're in the middle of a validation process and we always remember to set it back to false at the end, right? Sounds good in theory, but when you put it into practice, you kind of figure out, yeah, it's there's a little bit of problems there, especially when you're talking about more than two or three entities. When you're talking about context-specific validation, it's not just the entity, it's an entity in a given context. Now, the problem that we have here is the problem of not making roles explicit. Our classes are fulfilling just too many roles. And what we need to do is we need to take all those roles, split them up, and make them explicit. So what that means in terms of validation is that we want to look at what does it actually mean for what is an entity as a role. Say, okay, that's an I entity, no big deal. And a customer is an I entity and an order is an I entity, fine. That's one role. But the more interesting role is this role over here. It says, I validator of T. I validate entities. And you can ask me to validate whatever entity based on my type. So we could have an I validator of customer, an I validator of order, an I validator of address. And the way all this stuff hooks together, at least using .NET and the regular generics implementation, those people on Java, I'm sorry, generics isn't that strong enough yet. Um, the way that this is hooked up is that if someone wants to validate a customer in a certain way, they take these two interfaces, they take the validator and the customer, say, I am going to write a validator for customer without actually changing any of the customer code. So on the outside, I'm going to implement a new class, call it a customer validator. And that way, because I have expressed my intent, I am the validator or a validator for customer, I can put whatever rules I want in here. I also don't have to put all my customer's validation rules into one of these. As we know, as the system progresses and develops, we get new rules coming in all the time. We wouldn't want to change code that already works, is written, debugged, stable, unit tested, and everything. The great thing about this is that we can write a new class that's also, you know, I'm another customer validator. There's nothing that says all validation has to be in a single class. Absolutely, if the rules themselves are very different from each other, then it makes sense to split them up into their own classes. The way that all of this gets wired up is as follows. So it started out by saying, I want to persist a customer. Previously, we had to dot validate the customer first. At this point in time, we're saying, no, the actual requirement is, before persisting, writing to the database, validate. So that's a persistence concern. So the persistence framework can turn around and say, 
service locator, please find me everything that's an I validator of customer. They gave me a customer to save, give me a way to validate it. And that service locator says, oh yeah, I got a customer validator. I'll new one up for you and here you go. At that point in time, persistence can turn to that and say, please validate this customer for me. Like I said, we could have multiple customer validators like this and it could loop over each one saying, validate customer, validate customer, get a whole bunch of validation errors and then pop them out at the end. General idea being that this class over here and all of these classes can be added over the lifetime of a project without having to rip out the guts of your existing system in order to make it happen. You can plug in additional validation rules without touching any of the existing code, without breaking any of your existing interfaces. That's a big deal. I know some people are going to turn around and say, yeah, that's, that's not object-oriented. But the thing is that nobody said what the implementation of the customer validator was. It can turn around and call customer if customer has a dot validate method. This is especially common when you're looking at extending a code base that already has some validation of its own inside and you'd like to do some additional validation around the edges. So those people are saying, well, wait a minute, won't that make it difficult to find out where my validation rules are? Now, it would if we viewed source as merely a bunch of text files. But the thing is that we can do static analysis on our code. There are all sorts of tools out there, and depend is one of them, where you can come to this tool and say, find me all my customer validators. Find me all the classes in my source which implement iValidator of customer. So I can either logically put them all in the same solution, as files, and not always I can do that. So there are static analysis tools that can allow me to query my code at design time, similar to how the system works at runtime, in order to find out this information. What's the structure of my system? In essence, what we're doing is we're structuring our system at design time, very similar to how it runs at runtime. Follows the same patterns. So for things that, you know, regular customer validation logic that's entirely internal, maybe you'd like to keep that inside your customer. But there are some logics that, you know, customer validator that also looks at addresses, that also looks at order history, that also looks at, you know, whatever it is about customer. Previous interaction with the sales rep, do they pay their bills on time? We can add all sorts of validators around this customer without ever changing the customer's code. And that, at the end of the day, keeps this application code clear of the infrastructure. It's very clear what the boundary is. There's only one call. You don't have all this dot validate, dot validate, dot validate, is validating, was validating, should be validating state that we always need to remember to clean up. So that's one example of looking at more infrastructure style interfaces like iValidator as a role in its own right. That's one kind of intentional interface. Now let's take a look at data access. Data access is a fairly common scenario when looking at service layer code. Get an object from your ORM, your object relational mapper, call a method on it, and commit. No big deal, standard style of work. And when using the domain model pattern, our make preferred method can look something like this. Regular, classic, looping over orders, looping over order lines, doing some work with the database, change my state, save it, commit at the end. So far, you know, domain model, standard kind of work, nice, clean, object-oriented, great. Have an ORM, make sure that all this stuff just magically gets loaded into memory keeps my domain model clean, consistent, but unfortunately has a performance impact. So lazy loading in this scenario creates performance problems that often you don't see them when, you know, just a developer working on their machine 
the customers that they test the system on, it's you know a customer with an order or two, with an order line or three. It always runs fast on my machine. Well, of course, never tested it in the real world. Once this lazy loading gets dragged out into the real world, you know, that one call could lead to a thousand calls over here, or ten thousand calls. And what if we have another loop in there? A loop and a loop and a loop. This simple, clean, object-oriented code, standard data access fair for anybody doing in a hibernate or whatever, can create thousands of calls to the database. So that performance problem is something that most people don't view as a design problem because, hey, we worked according to best practices from the design. We have a domain model. We're using an ORM. Hey, you know, this is, this is great. Everybody else is still doing data sets and crap like that. We're at the bleeding edge. Only thing is that these performance problems, the source comes from not making roles explicit. So while we would like to eagerly fetch this, while we'd like to eagerly fetch all our unshipped orders and all their order lines from the database when we're loading up the customer the first time, different use cases have different graphs of objects that all start at the customer. When making a customer preferred, we want this graph of objects. But when we're going to add an order to a customer, well, we just want the customer itself. No unshipped orders, no order lines, nothing. The problem that we have is that there's a role hiding in this picture. And we haven't made it explicit in our code. We're talking about the actor. What's the customer doing? Rather than what role does the customer play in this use case? And what we'd like to do is to have a different fetching strategy for the same customer. Sometimes eagerly fetch, sometimes lazy load. Going back, the main message, we've got to make roles explicit. The challenge is training ourselves to see these roles, often in the code that we've already written. In this case, the two roles that we had in the previous picture are making a customer preferred and adding an order. The customer plays both of these roles. He obviously plays more in the system. But what we do here is we say, rather than from an infrastructure, I validator perspective, these roles are part of the domain, part of what the system does, not how it does it. So often when you look at the system, you're seeing these use cases, those use cases can be concretely represented in your code with these interfaces. Once you have these interfaces in place, and hey, it's just a little bit of typing to write an interface, have your service layer be specific. Rather than saying, give me a customer, say, no, no, no. Why would I ask you to give me a customer if I know by the next line that I'm going to be making it preferred? Why don't I tell you which role I'm looking for? I don't just want customer. I want a customer so that I can make him preferred. Once this the service layer is really the main actor in our system that knows this, right? Someone called the web service that said, make customer preferred ID. The service layer knows this. What we'd like to do is to take that knowledge and push it down to the rest of the system. And the way that we do that is by A, making the role explicit, and B, using it. Once the service layer said, this is what I want, ORM, please go make it happen. Our ORM can say, hey, you got it. I'll go get my fetching strategy and create it for you. Fetching strategy is actually what we want to say on top of this role, which is I make customer preferred, 
I would like to specify somewhere else, this is how you load the graph. Not in the service layer, not in my domain model, off to the side. So like we saw before, I said, okay, so I have my regular domain roles, and I'm going to introduce an infrastructure role right at the bottom there. Like we saw before, an I validator of T, now we have an I fetching strategy of T. That says, I'll be the one that you come to to find out how to load various T's. So if we have a performance problem with making customers preferred, let's write a fetching strategy for it. And this fetching strategy will implement I fetching strategy of T where T is the specific role that we're talking about. And it can say, you should get, when you're bringing the customer, their unshipped orders and their order lines too. Again, it's extending around the edges. But the thing that makes this possible is having that explicit role that says, this is the use case I'm in. We're not just loading a customer here. We're loading a customer in a specific context. And then we can start introducing fetching strategies of T, auditing of T, validators of T, all based on things that are context specific. The first time around when we saw validators, we said, well, okay, we're gonna have a validator of T where T is customer. But one of the things that we know in larger, more substantial systems, that validity is also dependent on context, right? Depending on who you are and who the customer is, then the kind of validation rules that we're going to be putting in place are different. I don't want to validate customer. I like to validate customer when I'm making him preferred. I like to validate customer when I'm adding a new order. So having these explicit roles that don't just tell me from an infrastructure perspective what I'm going to be doing, but from a domain use case perspective, what I'm going to be doing it too, these two pieces, when I put them together, can solve validation problems, extensibility problems, and performance problems. Here's how it wires up similar to what we saw before. Rather than saying, please persist this customer, now we're saying, get me this customer out of the database. I want to do something with it. But rather than asking for customer, I say, get me an I make customer preferred. Now, the only thing is that there's really only one class that implements that, and that's customer. So from a persistence perspective, right, and Hibernate can know this. Say, oh, okay, is that what you want? Then I'll just get a fetching strategy for the role that you gave me. Find the fetching strategy, similar to how I found the validator before. This service locator is, for those of you with a dependency injection background or containers, whatever you want to call them. We have Unity for Microsoft, we've got Castle Windsor, we've got Spring.net, we've got Structure Map, we've got Ninjek, we've got tons of frameworks that do the service locator stuff for us. All we really need to do is say, you know, these are the objects that we're going to be working with, register them in. And all this magic just happens without very much work on our end. All we need to do is to be explicit. That point in time when an hibernate comes and says, what's the strategy? Turns around and says, oh, the strategy is when you get the customer, go get their order lines and their, or the orders and their order lines. And all of a sudden, instead of having thousands of calls to the database, all that's been replaced with a single call that gets the customer and the orders and the order lines. And the thing is, you don't have to think about this in advance. Right? I had a system working in place. I said, oh my god, I've got performance problems. I need a fetching strategy. Plug a fetching strategy in on the side. That problem's been solved. So I can tweak the performance of the system over time, plugging in additional code as needed, all of it on the basis that I was originally explicit about the roles in the system. Not so much fetching strategy of T, that's not the interesting role, or validator of T. The only place where that gets called is from the infrastructure. It's about my domain roles, about what it is 
that we're dealing with here? What are my use cases? Once I represent that explicitly, I can do validators of T and fetching strategies of T and I can do auditors of T and security of T and encryption of T. I can add all of these cross-cutting concerns without changing the core behaviors of my system, without touching any of that code, without destabilizing it. So let's bring this to the next step. Saw it in terms of data access, saw it in terms of validation. Third one is the service layer. Now, service layers are things that have, have a tendency to grow. They start out fairly simple with something like this. You have a web service with a couple of methods on it. Life's good. And then we get an additional business requirement and we add another method. And we get an additional business requirement or two and then we add a few more methods. Now, the more of these that we have, you know, each one has its own implementation. We've got a lot of work to do. But the problem is that they're all kind of lumped together on that same service. And we get multiple developers trying to work on the same class. And we got you know, overloads, the change credit calling the change address, and the change address calling the, uh, the, the get preferred status. And all of these start calling into each other. Developers start fighting over these classes like a bone. It's, it's not a pretty sight when these service layers grow larger and larger. But the thing is that we're kind of at a loss in terms of tools. How do we take this broad service layer that's supposed to provide service to a lot of clients and split it up? Often we try based on things like the entities in our system, like we're used to. We have our customer service, we have our order service, we have our product service. And of course the services start calling each other because there's a fair amount of overlap depending on what you're doing and what the context is. The best thing for us to have would be to have that, that same sort of split like we saw before. Just like anybody can write a validator and anybody can write a fetching strategy, we'd like anybody to write a service layer or a, a slice of a service layer. So the thing is we don't so much want to look at what the main services are in terms of groupings, but to look at what are my roles? What are the things that represent what the system does? And those are actually the methods. The methods themselves are really the unit of granularity. They're the use cases in our system. So there's something here that we'd like to make explicit but it seems like, it, how are we going to make a method explicit? Well, it's not by looking at it as a method, but as a unit of work, a, a packaging in its own right. So in essence, what we're saying is we have the thing itself, which is the message that got sent to us. If we don't think about it as a method, right, this is a SOAP web service call. We got a bunch of data, a SOAP packet, a message that said change address. That means something. The rest of the system is dealt with how do we handle that message. So we can now tease apart our service and say well rather than looking at it as just a collection of methods, for every single one of these use cases, each one can be an independent method, an independent message, its own class. So anytime we want to add something to the system, we just add a new class that says, okay, we've got another message. We have change address, make preferred, change credit, customer got married. Customer got in a car accident. We can add all this without changing any of the previous structures, without being concerned which other developer has checked out which message class. And in terms of the handling of the message, each one can turn around and say, okay, 
I'm going to handle the change address, and I'm going to handle the make preferred, and I'm going to handle the change credit. And like we saw before, we could actually have handlers which handle more messages. So if we have cross-cutting behavior that says, in all cases for you know, two out of these three, audit. So I'll have an auditing message handler which handles both message A and message B. And I can mix and match. Have one handler handle one message, have one handler handle multiple messages, depending on what it is that I need to do. Each developer works on their own class, writes their own logic, calls their, calls their relevant domain model methods, or databases, or external web services, or what have you. At this point in time, it becomes fairly easy to look at how do we extend the system as new behaviors come in. Some options can be change the handler that you currently have or throw it away and write a new one. When we're talking about software as a service companies that want to customize the behavior of their system based on different clients, we can look at having different message handlers. We can actually go into the heart of our system, pick out a certain piece of functionality, and plug another piece in. For a lot of people that build frameworks that their, their customers need to extend, it's the same sort of pattern. Design our system in such a way that our own code and the customer's code behaves the same way. We can start looking at what the ordering of the message handling logic is. It becomes quite a bit easier to version all of this as well. The more separate it is, the more cohesive it is. And if anything, what we're seeing is that it's kind of full circle. We've stepped away from the way we used to do object-oriented programming into this kind of style of making roles explicit. But all of the principles of being cohesive being cohesive and loosely coupled. The open-closed principle, right? We're open to extension. It's very easy to add a new handler, new validator, new fetching strategy. But closed to modification because we're cohesive. All of the principles that OO brought us in the first place are maintained by this style. But we also get the ability to extend very easily. Technically, all this stuff is simple. The hard part is saying, well, what are my messages? What are the use cases in the system? That's the part that you've got to get right. You've got to know what your system does. And that, that's something that no pattern book can solve for you. But once you have that, these little techniques well, they create an environment where well, every developer gets their own little sandbox, gets their own little toy, each one chews on their own little thing and says, okay, I'm done. A lot of the problems that we have in software development is when we have multiple developers needing to work together on the same bit of code, collaborating intensively. Well, we can try to do pair programming, but some problems are a little bit bigger than that and take longer to solve. We need to find some way to break them apart so that each developer can work pretty much in isolation, get their piece working, and because we have these contracts, these roles which represent how the various pieces of the system fit together, it all integrates very cleanly together. So, like I mentioned before, we can have multiple message handlers. So new logic for the same message can be written in a new handler. It can, if it doesn't do anything, then a pipeline of handlers can run at one after another. We can also have one handler embed information in the message as it goes down the pipeline for another. It's called content enrichment. A lot of things become possible. Now, some people can look at this and say, oh, it's a pipeline pattern. Oh, it's a chain of responsibility pattern. All of this stuff you can get to if you need it. Right? You don't want to think in advance and say, should I use the chain of responsibility pattern in here? Do I need to set up a pipeline? Wait with that kind of stuff. You can figure that out later. Once you have the message in place, once you've thought about, oh, okay, I've got, know what I'm going to be doing, 
Now I can say, okay, for this message, chain of responsibility. For that message, I want to do a pipeline. Over here, I want to do an, an intercepting filter. I'm going to write a new message handler that looks for a specific bit of data in that message. And if that data exists, I'm going to you know, write it to some special log file, and then I'm going to stop the processing. I'm going to intercept the rest of the system, stop it right there. That's kind of like what dynamic proxies can do if you're doing object-oriented inheritance and thing lo things like that. In other words, a lot of patterns can follow from this style when and where you need them. That's what we're trying to get away from, the, the, the necessity to predict ahead of time. All the pieces, chain of responsibility here, pipeline over there, intercept filter here, dynamic proxy over there. We've got more patterns than we know what to do with. What we'd really like to do is say, well, I want to know when I need it and use it only then and in a specific place. I don't necessarily want to use it everywhere. By having this hook for the use case, a lot of the problems become quite a bit simpler. And you can pick what you need. So in here, we're just going to see how it works all over again. Message comes in off of the queue. We have our infrastructure pulling it off. It says, OK, I've got a given message type. Someone said, change address. Let's find all the message handlers for that. We create a bunch of them, give them back, and say, OK, now call. Handle this, handle that. And we can add a third one in here, and then we can start talking about, well, let's configure the ordering of the handlers. If you didn't think about it that in advance, said, well, do I want a chain of responsibility? Do I want a pipeline? You can figure it out later. It's a small change to the service locator. That's all. So by putting all of these pieces together, all of them hinge on just figuring out what your roles are. By making your roles explicit, all the things that we've seen, validation, data access, service layer, security, they all follow the same pattern. Don't need to design up front in advance. All these pieces figure out how they're going to play together. If you're explicit about what the use case is, what the roles are in your system, then you can extend around the edges the behaviors that you need. So at this point in time, I'm going to take uh, about two or three questions, because this stuff is often fairly different and not very easy to swallow, although it's simple to look at and to understand. It's not always intuitive to see how you're going to take this back and start working with it. So we've got time for about two or three questions. Anybody have a question? Yes, sir? So the question is, um, one of the things that would result from working in this style is that a single class may, may implement a large number of interfaces and that this I is counter to, to often the way that people use interfaces. If the interfaces overlap, okay. Um, well, for, let, let, let's drill into that. So, so we have two d distinct pieces of business functionality in the system that mean different things to the business. And if we as technical people created interfaces that overlapped, we probably didn't identify those roles correctly. Right? Different use cases, different parts of the system mean different things, should be fairly distinct roles. So, oh, okay, the question is, if the roles are distinct, why put them in the same object? Okay, so let's say we have two different methods. Uh, one of them is I make customer preferred, and the second one is I add orders to a customer. Now, both of them are interested in the customer's current state. Okay? If the customer doesn't pay their bills, they're a delinquent customer, when they go to add an order, they shouldn't get any discount, and we shouldn't allow someone to make them preferred unless that person is a department supervisor. So they're both interested in looking at the, sh the shared state of the underlying object in making their decision, in implementing their behavior. But in terms of what they mean towards the outside world, they mean very different things. 
So it's often the looking at a shared bunch of state that causes the same class to implement multiple interfaces. And that's to be understand, right? We often have, you know, the result of one use case changes some state that is then used in another use case. So that, that's why we, we would see the same class customer implementing multiple interfaces because, well, it's involved in multiple use cases. Okay, does that answer your question? Super. Another question? Yes, sir. Code examples. Um, so the fetching strategy example is already on my blog, and I'm going to have a link to the blog at the end. Uh, the service layer examples are part of the end service bus open source project, so it implements all the patterns uh, that you saw before with uh, samples and runtime, um, everything with the queues. Uh, validators, I'm afraid I don't have online, but it's pretty much more of the same. Okay? Any other questions? Okay. So that's, yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the question was, um, given that, you know, after seeing this presentation and seeing already three interfaces, like uh, iValidator, iFetching Strategy, and iMessage Handler, uh, developers may go overboard and start adding interfaces left, right, and center, um, and that that could get them into trouble. Uh, I suppose that's the, the, that's the corollary of it. Um, well, defining the interface itself does nothing. It's, ju it's just saying, this is a role. Now, in order to have, have this role mean something, in order to have message handler of T do anything interesting, we need to have the use cases, the messages, those roles mapped out. So it's, while developers could create more and more of these interfaces until they actually had beef which is, you know, what are my use cases, they wouldn't get any value out of that. And developers are a fairly pragmatic bunch. They won't write code that they feel is unnecessary. Um, that's often a lot of the, the tension with patterns is that, you know, do this pattern, it'll make your life better. And like, I tried it, I wrote a whole bunch of code, it didn't make my life better. So the, I haven't seen a lot of cases where they go overboard in terms of uh, writing interfaces that aren't used but part of that is saying, you don't have to. You don't have to define this stuff in advance because if you find out later that you need it, you can introduce an iMessage handler of T you know, six months into a project. And nothing bad will happen. It's an additional interface as long as you had the original roles in place. So it's, in my experience, I haven't seen many cases where developers uh, went too far with this. Um, it's, it's often the difficulty is that they got the roles wrong, that they identified roles from a technical language perspective. I create customer, I update customer, I read customer, rather than from a more business perspective of I make customer preferred, I change the customer's address. So that's something that, that you do need to watch out for quite a bit more than the, 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 the technical filler of additional interfaces. So, we got time for one last question. One last question, yes. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the question was if we can get some more examples of uh, the difference between uh, technical infrastructure roles and uh, domain style roles uh, so that we'll, we can see the difference between them. Often it's in terms of uh, language. In other words, if you came to a, a business person and you said, I validator of T, and they turn around and say, huh? That's a good sign it's a technical one. If you say, I'm going to make the customer preferred, they oh, okay, I understand that. I'm going to change their address. Okay, that, that means something to them. So it's often uh, what it represents that, that indicates what, what's going on. 
uh, iMessage handler of T, iFetching strategy of T. It's, it, it's fairly clear that, or iSecurity of T, iAuditing of T. A lot of the stuff that, uh, as developers, we view them as cross-cutting concerns are those technical roles. And on the flip side, all the ones that express use cases, uh, what's going on in the system and why, what's, what's the user trying to do with the system, those are the domain roles. Okay? All right, so I'll close with Yoda's uh, famous words to us. Once you rose, you've made expli explicit, you've made have. God forbid he speaks awfully. Extensibility and flexibility are simple. That's really it. That, that, that's, you know, as a developer, something I've always been looking for. Just give me a simple way to do it. Say, you know, work like this, and it'll work out okay. You don't have to worry about rigidity creeping in. You don't have to think up front about all the pipeline and chain of responsibility and all these patterns. Because, hey, it's a lot to keep in your head. But once you have this domain role in place, as the requirement comes in for, you know, SOX compliance, say, okay, so what does that mean? Well, we need to audit this. Oh, auditable of T. And we need to log this. Oh, log of T. So anything that kind of comes out technical from those requirements, just add an additional one on the side and say, oh, okay, for, for logging, actually, we're going to use log for net. And for auditing, we're going to use this third-party product. And this, we're going to write ourselves uh, on our own security infrastructure. We can figure out what we need to do when we need to do it, which is really at the crux of Agile. So a lot of this stuff, while it doesn't look object-oriented at face value, it implements a lot of the principles that make OO such a good idea. It gives us the extensibility that we need without designing big things up front. And, you know, in general, it solves practical day-to-day -day problems at multiple layers of our application. So, at this point, I'd like to thank you all very much. My blog is here, www.udidahan.com. Find lots of blogs and articles about this and, and other stuff. And if you have questions, please, you can uh, grab me now or always send me an email to email at udidahan.com. Thank you all very much, and have a great evening.